right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Jerry Mikulski, who is up in Portland, Oregon. How are you doing, Jerry? I'm doing very well. And my wife just now took off from Portland en route to your fair city. Oh, very good. Very good. well. Yeah. You can tell her the tell her the weather's nice. Um, not that that's a surprise, but that's uh, yeah, terrific. That's pretty, I love that. It's pretty nice right now. And Jerry is curator of the world's largest mind map guide to the world in context, tech visionary, keynote speaker, and an expert on trust and mistrust. I was actually, when I was looking at this earlier, I was just thinking, yeah, you can really be an expert on trust without being an expert on mistrust too, right? Because <laughs> and yeah. It, you'd be surprised how many people aren't thinking about the mistrust part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, let's let's get let's get right into it. Um, first of all, can you define? I mean, I know people kind of know what trust means, but in the context of what you're talking about, could you define define trust from your perspective? Sure. There's a ton of different uh, definitions of trust and trust models. Uh, I think uh, an easy one is sort of. Uh, someone's ability to meet expectations. You know, I, I trust that this person will do that later on. Uh, one nice model is the ABI model, ab ability, benevolence, and intent. Uh, and that sort of, it also separates down into cognitive trust, which is, do I think you can do the thing you said you're going to do? And do I think you're going to do it? For which I don't need to like you at all. And mm -hmm. aff an affective trust, which is, do I think you have my best interests at heart? Do I think you have good intentions? That whole part of it. And those don't have to be in the same person. So. The, I always say, like, we know that Dr. Evil is always going to try to kill Austin Powers, but isn't going to be able to, but we can trust he's always going to try, right? So so trust doesn't always have to be about good things. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. So, I mean, that whole idea of, like, consistency or predictability, uh, it's, and I think that's what... When people when people set out to build trust, I uh, you say in salespeople or whatever whatever role you're in trying to build trust is, I don't sometimes I don't think they or I think they overlook something as fundamental as that is just being consistent, being predictable, and just simply doing what you say you'll do. Right, exactly, exactly. And and I'm an odd fish because I'm not about how do you build high trust teams or how do you mm -hmm. build trust in an interaction. Those, there's, I know a bit about that and I would point you to other experts on that. Sure. I wound up somehow really caring a lot about trust and mistrust in institutional design. Mm. And, and it shows up for me in things like the compulsory education system and Wikipedia. And years ago, uh, I, I started reading some John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O, a retired New York high school teacher. And I got to meet him a couple of times and have, have a meal with him. Um, and he was talking about the hidden curriculum of schooling, which is all about mistrust. And that, that it started to soak in that we've designed our institutions from a mistrust of the average person because there is a legitimate worldview that says most people are just out for themselves. You know, in that life is nasty, brutish, and short. And we've got to design our systems to protect ourselves against the bad actors. And I'm of the belief that most people would like to help and make things better. And when we design the systems against the bad actors first early, we actually separate everybody else and we, we, we sort of cut the genius out of the room. So, so kind of to get into the heart of the matter quickly, I, I'm interested in like, sure. how do, how do, what's the gesture that I can do with you to build trust, which is like make three, make three commitments and meet those three commitments quickly. That'll build trust, boom. I'm much more interested in how did we normalize mistrust? Yeah, listen, I, I know that's obviously it's it's extremely interesting. But yeah, so if you think about it, right, human nature being what it is, you know, we're kind of naturally cynical, or maybe we're not naturally cynical. Maybe we have been educated. Maybe we that's a learned behavior over right. time. But yeah, it seems like to trust institutions almost would if you were very trusting in most institutions you'd kind of be an outlier because most people would go oh yeah but you don't know really what's going on or you can't really trust this so how how does how does an institution overcome that well it's really interesting because even the word institution i can see you saying yeah. it i can see you saying the word as <laughs> as as you formed the syllables on your lips and uttered the word i'm like yeah 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 there's a very good reason why people mistrust institutions or big government or whatever else and it's partly it's partly because most of the institutions we're used to dealing with don't trust us. They're, they're, they're designed mm. to assume we're, we're out to get the most we possibly can greedily or whatever else. 
And I will add that most of the solutions I've found from other people's work um, that solve this problem either create novel kinds of institutions that make us feel really queasy and, and scared or don't even need institutionalization, that we, we, we wind up taking back responsibility for some of those things to ourselves and our neighbors and wind up cooperating through trust. And when without trust, those cooperations are not, not feasible. I have, a, I have a, a little equation I made up, scarcity equals abundance minus trust. Mm. Because in situation after situation, I can point to you to a situation where something is abundant, but because there's no trust, we wind up making it scarce. And it's, it's an artificial scarcity that capitalism likes because there's an equation in capitalism that scarcity equals value and therefore there can't be a business model if there isn't scarcity so we should try to create some artificial scarcity all of which is bullshit to me yeah yeah no it is and and it's uh, it, it's interesting that that we that we promote this idea of a of fine everything being finite or the pie you know and basically if you get a chunk of the pie well you just took that away from me there's only a certain instead of as you said like abundant even abundant mindsets i mean to think that there is enough you know for everybody um that that's a I think that's a that's an underlying underpins a lot of things. So you just mentioned there. I just wanted to come back. You said some when you create a, an, an institution or a system or whatever it is that it can turn you know it can turn out to be kind of a bit strange looking in its in its constitution. Could you just elaborate a little on that? Yeah. So one of the first places I that that I picked this up, I picked up the trail was from this guy John Taylor Gatto and a bunch of other thinkers about schooling, Ivan Illich, Grace Llewellyn. Uh, Paulo Freire, there's a whole bunch of critics of the compulsory education system. And, and the answer to compulsory education is, is a, a poorly named area called unschooling or de-schooling or something like that, where really it's about how do you build scaffolding so that young people or anybody who wants to learn at any age can just go get the right equipment and learn on their own around things that they really care about in some with some feedback loops so that we're not talking about feral kids uh, you know, on Lord of the Flies. We're actually talking about how do we deinstitutionalize it so that people actually learn and are motivated to learn and learn very quickly. Because one of the things Gatto used to say is um, it, it, it only takes about 100 hours for the average person to learn either basic reading or basic math, just 100 hours mm -hmm. of learning. And there's only one variable in there. They have to want to. That's it. Mm. That's it. And guess what? They don't all want to on the third month of the 12th year of their life or where, wherever it is we start teaching each of those things, right? But we're not like in synchrony that way. It shows up for somebody who's uh, 10 years old because they want to read Instagram posts and like, right. awesome. or, they're in, or they're in Fortnite and they're starting to use text chat and they can't understand it. So now they're highly motivated to learn to read. It's going to take 100 hours and then we're on board. So, so Deinstitutionalization is really, really interesting. But then the question is, what are the minimal handrails you need to maintain mm -hmm. some kind of order and, and so forth? And we rapidly get into really muddy waters about capitalism versus anarchism versus other sorts of things. It's very, it's a very interesting, turbulent, and kind of sometimes really uh, emotion and value laden, uh, emotion laden kind of uh, area. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. But I'm glad this Godot turned up, unlike the one in the uh, in the play. But um, the um, but talking about talking about this is um, you know is the mis the mistrust in 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 education etc is we just have a but we if you think about it how much has education evolved I mean you could go back to Socrates and he's sitting around teaching people in a classroom or you know wherever so there's this trope that you will hear very very often in fact Sir Ken Robinson I think uses this in the opening of his famous talk. You could go back a thousand years and, and you would recognize the classroom of the past because mm -hmm. we haven't changed it at all. It's actually total and utter nonsense uh, because between the U.S. Civil War and the U.S. Uh, and the First World War, we basically industrialized schooling. Before mm -hmm. the Civil War, right after the Civil War, we had thousands and thousands of one-room schoolhouses where we mixed up all the grade levels and Susie was teaching Bobby his numbers and, you know, and she was a couple of years ahead of him and no, 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 It was really, it felt kind of haphazard, but we had a very literate population. When de Tocqueville runs around the U.S. and goes and visits uh, people in the backwoods of Kentucky, he, he writes in, in Democracy in America, he writes, 
these people were literate. They had like magazines and some books on their shelf. They could read, they were participating in democracy. And he was really impressed by that and justifiably so. But if you go back a thousand years or more, you get walking and talking and thinking and engagement in life and not the separation of work, life, work, uh, learning and play. That little Venn diagram was one circle. If you go talk mm -hmm. to like uh, Bushmen in Africa, when they go on a hunt, they're playing, learning, and working all together. And that's what life was like a lot around the world. We managed to then rationalize and industrialize the whole thing so that you go to school for a while and recess is when you play, but not in, like, it's dumb. It's dumb. Mm -hmm. and, and why we did that, there's all kinds of really good explanations, but hitting undo on that is extremely difficult. Yeah, yeah, look, that's great. I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you uh, corrected me on that because actually, my my grandmother taught a one room school room in the west of Ireland, um, where my dad and everybody went, and uh, yeah, it was all different grades, literally. In a, in a, I mean, I've seen the buildings kind of ruined now, but it literally that. was, literally was one room. Um, so, so how do we start to, how do, because I mean, right now, the way school is constituted, it seems like it's becoming less and less relevant uh, to the to the kids, especially as they change and, and, and uh, a lot of different influences. But how do you start to deconstruct or de-school, as you say? Sure. Um, well, a couple of things. One is uh, the old joke, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer yeah. to that is one bite mm -hmm. at a time. Uh, and then I, I had a I had a podcast long ago, I, and I closed it down before podcasting got cool again. But we had two two episodes of my podcast about unschooling, and on one of them, well, one of my guests asks uh, the group. He says, "So what's de-schooling?" And and one of the people, one of the adults who was an unschooler, said something that will stay with me forever. He said, uh, "It's basically the process of healing their curiosity." Because mm. kids are kids are born curious. They're just born. Ask any poke any five year old. They're little yeah. learning machines. Before we put them in the institution, they're little learning machines that have figured out one or several languages, how to play mom against dad, uh, rules to games, how to break the rules or bend the rules, like all kinds of stuff that's, that's hard to learn without ever going into the institution. And then we put them in this thing that's like a big industrial mechanism that's meant to teach them a bunch of stuff, but in fact breaks their sense of agency and responsibility, uh, test them individually when actually collaboration is the thing we want from them later on. It's a whole bunch of different uh, dysfunctions here. So an interesting path to how to fix this is just one bite at a time. How do I create some scaffolding where you could go for mathematics and go learn and be become involved in some communities that are, that are learning math and, and figure out how to do math completely separately. And maybe that's the Khan Academy and some online learning, maybe it's something else, right? And then you might say, that felt good. How do I do that for something else? And I, I don't think we have to replace the, the whole school system wholesale. And I certainly don't wanna try tackling the, the castle of education, whether it's lower education or higher, they are impregnable. Uh, and they have these massive bureaucracies and budgets and lots of people who don't want to be tipped over. I want to sort of usurp their power and sneak their populations over onto a much more interesting, humane uh, uh, mesh network. Um, I call it the big mm -hmm. fungus, uh, because to me, it's, it's like a fungal mycelial growth underground that trades nourishment with the plants and, and, and life forms around it. And and if you think about over the last couple of years, like with the pandemic, etc., I mean, take higher education for a moment. Um, I think for the first time, a lot of people are starting to question the value equation there in a way that perhaps they didn't before. And let's face it, those institutions have got a, you know, they've got a fantastic gig going and they're going to fight to the nail not to allow that to, to evolve. We have a niece who's graduating right now and her experience of undergraduate was pandemic mostly. And we feel really bad for her because she didn't get a normal experience of what that is. Separate thought. Um, the difference between undergrad college when I went to it and college now is that these things are country clubs and they're competing on uh, like, like country club level uh, kinds of kinds mm -hmm. of attributes. Uh, as opposed to places where you might learn. And the administrative burden of these things has gone completely over the top. It's not really about, about the learning. It's really, uh, there's a whole bunch mm -hmm. of really dumb mechanisms at, at play in this marketplace. And then another sort of switch slides. Um, a lot of large employers like Google are busy in public saying, hey, people, we used to think you needed a, a college degree, in fact, from one of these schools and to pass these tests to work here. It turns out when we did the analysis, 
there was little correlation between those mm -hmm. things and people who did well at Google. So if you will go try this test or, or, or experiment and then come back and na, na 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 if you will jump through a couple of these hoops with us and for us, we will probably figure out pretty quickly whether you're a good fit here. And the more employers that do that, that drives back into the whole system. The more adults, mm -hmm. the more parents and kids coming into the workforce are going to be like, hmm, that's really interesting. Maybe I don't need this college degree after all. But but nobody is going to not yeah. go to college if they think it's going to damage their children's life prospects. That's a that you don't you're not going to do that. You're just not going to do that. It's too risky. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that's a tremendous point just to underline again because I, I'll give you an, uh, just an anecdote from a number of years back. Uh, I was I was running a company and the parent company, the HR department belonged to the parent company. And I was looking at a resume one day and I said, wow, this guy, what experience, this guy rocks, right? Or gal, I can't even remember which going to hire. Called up HR and said, oh, I spotted this resume. I want to get him in. Um, I'm sorry, he doesn't have a college degree. I was saying, what? And they said, we only hire people with college degrees. And I said, but look at his work experience. I don't care about his college degree. Do you care about my college degree? Because it's completely irrelevant to the job I'm doing today. Right. <laughs> but but that to your point, until that changes, we're going to force people to go to college, get in debt, you know, think that they have to decide their whole life at 17 or 18. And it's it's nuts. And and right now we're about to have some, you know, in the in the US, we're about to have some high level conflict over the forgiveness of college debt, right. which is like which is like two degrees separated from the actual interesting issues in the middle of this whole topic that we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we just we have our priorities all mixed up. Part of the problem for me is we have normalized and we take for granted. And when, in fact, we take as the only way to do things because otherwise somebody would have changed it, right? Mm -hmm. These terrible systems built from mistrust where the badge on your, you know, on your diploma from a particular school is supposed to be a proxy for a whole bunch of other things that it is a really poor proxy for. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think when you're talking about mistrust, there's probably no greater uh, betrayal that people feel is when they emerge from college and unfortunately realize that mm. potentially their degree isn't worth the paper. It, it's well, printed not, on. not only that, um, if you were coming into the workforce right now, you should appropriately be deeply concerned. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're entering not just the great resignation from sort of the, from the pandemic, but kind of the great readjustment, the great reshuffle. Um, my wife just, just published a, a book last August called Flux, Eight Superpowers for Thriving in a World of Constant Change. And one of her superpowers is mm -hmm. the portfolio career. And she's like, remember the fish ladder where you, you work for a few years here, you get promoted to supervisor, you get promoted to manager, you make your way up mm -hmm. to the CEO, that fish ladder broke. And it broke a long time ago. And every corporation is busy trying to get rid of as many full-time employees as they possibly can. And guess what? Technology is really helping. Technology is eating work. And I don't think artificial general intelligence is going to come anytime soon. But I think yep. computers are already more capable than humans in lots and lots of job work slices, right? And so, mm -hmm. and so the, 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 the time lag between starting a degree program and getting your degree and going into the workforce is pretty long. And you're, mm -hmm. you're placing a bet today on which degree for which thing. It's, if it's radiology, good luck to you, because it turns mm -hmm. out that now image recognition does better than radiologists at detecting certain kinds of cancers and tumors and other sorts of things. And, and, and pretty soon, because it's about healthcare, hospitals will be sued if they don't use the algorithm instead of the human because it's better. And so, how do you place your how do you place your bets in that world? It's really it's it's a very dangerous and difficult world. And uh, trust is actually uh, one of your other superpowers, uh, because if you build trusted relationships and have trusted networks and trust yourself, it's a variety of different sort of wrappers around trust. You might actually do well in that world. Yeah, I mean, the fascinating thing is, yeah, I mean, like my son's seventeen, and to be honest, the jobs, the jobs of the the jobs of the future. I mean, a lot of them haven't even been created yet, the jobs that they will do. And, you know, going into college, some of the things that you pursue are going to be redundant by the end of it. But there doesn't seem to be, that's where I think the massive disconnect is you don't seem to, you don't seem to feel that higher education or colleges are starting to look at, okay, you know, what does the future look like? What skills do they need for whatever? They're just happy doing the traditional. Exactly. And, and they're in a world of, of dramatic flux and how work is done and so forth. And one of the interesting things one might do is become a cyborg. 
And and mm -hmm. you mentioned at the top of the show that um, I've got uh, the world's largest man-made brain, which is true. I've been using a piece of software called The Brain since they rolled out their, their product 24 years ago. And wow. anybody can go browse my brain for free at jerrysbrain.com, no apostrophe, no space. Uh, you're in there, uh, as is your show. And uh, kind of everything worth remembering for the last 24 years for me is in there in context in a single mind map that is creeping up on a half million entries. Wow. So I am more of a cyborg than anybody I know because I have externalized a lot of what I care about. It hasn't replaced this one. In fact, it makes mm -hmm. this wet brain better because when I show people stuff in my brain and every day when I curate it, it refreshes the neural pathways in here. So my unedited recall of stuff is pretty good. Um, until my neurons tire out toward end of life. Uh, and then my wife isn't that worried because she's like, I'll just talk to your outboard brain. That'll be fine. Um, <laughs> but, but leaning into technology only makes sense kind of in a world where we have more trust because I could automate myself right out of existence and right out of work. Yeah. And I don't really want to do that. Uh, the New York Times had a, had a, a cover story. Um, New York Times Magazine had a cover story a couple of years ago about Sweden and a mining company in Sweden. And it's like the robots are coming, but this, but Sweden's going to be okay because there was kind of a social contract that the company and its employees had made where we will try really hard to automate everything because the only way we have a cost advantage is through automation. It's the only way we're going to make it. But anybody who's made redundant will have some other form of work with us. We're not going to get rid of you. And when America is a very cruel country this way, we don't have that kind of social contract kind of at any level. A couple mm -hmm. of companies are very ethical about this, but very few. We have a, we have a remarkably cruel system uh, at all fronts here, not just the mistrust, but there's like a systemic cruelty as well. Yeah, and if you think about it, uh, and here again, the, the trust factor uh, comes into play. If you think about it over the, over the last while, the artificial intelligence and, and rob robotics and, and machine learning, they've been hyped up to no end. And, you know, people have loved to write these stories like, oh, you know, no more of this, no more, you know, sales people are gone. They're going to be replaced by AI. This group is gone. This group, that group is gone. And there and there's never much talk, as you say, about the other kinds of jobs or augmenting that or what role humans and AI say can play together. Uh, and therefore, obviously, it, it, it ends up scaring people and the trust and they're going, well, why would I even go in? As you said, why would I even go into this career if a robot or a AI is going to replace me in a year or two? Absolutely. And so I think we're so we're creating, I think, a, a communal angst out there somewhat unnecessarily. And it's it's also exacerbated by the social the effects of social media yeah. and and so what we created was a, a free superconductor for memes and you know uh, junk advice mal you know malinformation mm -hmm. et cetera et cetera uh, which is which a few people in the world weaponized and figured out how to use tremendously at the same time fifty times in the last couple of days my wife and I or me just sitting there googled something or went out researching on the inner tubes and found stuff that was actually useful and valuable, which 30 years ago would have meant I would have walked down to the library, mm -hmm. thumbed through the card catalog, prayed that that book was on the shelf, <laughs> read through a paper book, gone to the photocopier maybe to make a copy of a couple of pages and paid a dime a page. Seriously, like, like <clears throat> this, this world is, is incredibly powerful as well. Mm -hmm. um, the only, one of the major problems is that the business model of the companies that are our major platforms in social media is all about selling us ads. And that means yep. they, have to, they have to invade our privacy and break our trust several times. They have to dumpster dive our data. Then they have to fill our world with noise called ads. Um, all of this to sort of fuel the whole thing. And it's like, that's kind of doomed. Like we need to find <laughs> some different ways of doing the same sorts of, of functions because the functionality of being able to find something at the drop of a hat and communicate with somebody like you and I are doing right now yeah. with zero marginal cost in high definition audio and video, that's marvelous. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that point that you just made there because, again, it's, I feel like a lot of people then see the platforms as a necessary evil, like, well, I have to be on it, I need to be on it. Same as you might say about school, you know, well, it's a necessary, you have to go, or college, a necessary evil. So, if, if everything, if of all of these things we feel are necessary evils, then that sets up a conflict immediately. Absolutely. And then I think the the people who will do better in the next couple of decades are the ones who question the necessary evils and find really substantive alternatives. It's a little bit like life hacking. 
You know, mm -hmm. what, I, what I like about life hacking is that it's a bunch of people oversharing information and trying to figure out <clears throat> how do I feel more rested? How do I have better sex? How do I, uh, whatever, whatever else it might be, right? Like mm -hmm. people are busy sharing out what, what they're up to. Um, and they have, we're in a world where they can post any way, any way they want and other people can find their advice and, you know, off and running. How do we do that? For education, how do we that do that mm. for all the all the other aspects of life that we're worried about? I just came from hosting a conversation a couple hours ago about mental health, and we were just we were kind of whining to each other about how broken the mental health systems really are. And mm -hmm. it, the systems are expensive, hard to get into, really hard to understand. Why is there not some nice collaborative, shared way to help each other make our way through the world with our brains intact? Yeah, no, I think that's a, we could get, we could, we could talk for another hour about, about that. I, I totally agree with you. I think, I think mental health is one of the biggest issues facing us. I don't think we're taking seriously the impact all of this stuff is having, not just on, on ourselves, but also our kids. And as you said, I mean, all we have today is still the same traditional, what do you do? You know, you break your leg, you go to the doctor, you you're you're not feeling great about yourself and the world you go to you go to a psychiatrist and never the twain shall speak you know what i mean they or shall meet everything is separated out but again it's old traditional kind of models and we've stigmatized it so come absolutely on. my mom came from the generation where you didn't go see a counselor unless mm -hmm. you were in extreme crisis or through a war or something like that and and i want to tie i want to tie mental health back to trust because mm -hmm. A lot of the, a, a, some big chunk of the forces that have us in this mental health crisis these days has to do with the fact that we're not trusted, our systems don't trust us, and we're not connected in community, so we're lonely, loneliness is a killer. All these different kinds of things are, are in, in great measure about trust. And once you start designing from trust, and I, I own the website designfromtrust.com, it's an idea that isn't a methodology yet, but, but could be. Um, if you start designing from trust, it suddenly turns on people's purpose. It can reconnect people in community. It releases the genius that's always present in the room because people generally are pretty damn smart. They may be mm -hmm. smart about baseball stats or, or cross stitch or something like that, but they're smart, right? Yeah. They, 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 we make our way through somehow. Um, it's just that the institutions that we live inside of often don't let our smartness shine. Yeah, and I think the, the, just the, the last point, just picking up on what you said there is, uh, I mean, the more connected we are, the more disconnected we are, this whole idea, well, online communities and all of this, uh, at the end of the day, yeah, I mean, there's a trust issue there, but also there's a certain like lack of reality there. And we're moved away from the idea of community as in connecting with real people, maybe just one at a time, and and changing you know, maybe maybe just being the best person you can and the best spouse you can be, best father you can be, best whatever you can be, and building from there. You're making a positive impact and you're building trust in those small, like one at a time, which is far more effective at the end of the day. And that's really what we need is kind of groundswell, if you like. And one of the very simple tools to do what you just said is listening. I call it mm -hmm. deep listening. Um, uh, I, th I believe we're in a crisis of not listening. I think people are talking past each other. Everybody's talking in the public domain. We're liking and posting and whatever. And we're actually not listening to each other one-to-one, -one, uh, as you just said. Mm -hmm. And if we did, a bunch of other problems would start to dissolve. Yeah, no, 100%. Great way to, uh, great way to round this off. I, I, I couldn't agree more about the listening. We're not listening. And, hey, and nowadays, the worst thing about it, I think, is we have normalized uh, rudeness and not listening. So, you know, we've normalized where I can be standing having a conversation with you and I can glance at my phone because a text came in and I just go, oh, yeah, now back to you. Exactly. And that's acceptable. And that's it's acceptable behavior. It, that's happening. And then behind the curtain, we've sort of weaponized mistrust in the sense of um, there are people who understand, I call it denial of discourse attacks. Because a denial of service attack is when I flood a, a web server with too mm -hmm. much traffic so it can't actually respond and it goes down. A denial of discourse attack is basically flooding the zone with bullshit, which is sort of a known yeah. strategy, so that discourse can't happen. So that people are just afraid. And when people are afraid, they're very easy to steer. Yeah. And we're in, a, we're in an era where that has happened to us already for years. 
and mm -hmm. we don't quite know how to get out of it. You know, Musk is buying Twitter, and I've read all kinds of advice on what he ought to do with Twitter, and he has his own ideas, which are pretty naive yeah. about what to do with Twitter, but it's an important conversation. Notice what happened to Trump when he was deplatformed after yeah. his presidency. It's like, wow. It's like, I, I could swear I hear some noise out there. Well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is fascinating. Um, listen, all all of uh, all of uh, Jerry's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure, thanks. I'm a strange guy who's been curating a, a mind map. You can find it at Jerry'sBrain.com. Uh, JerryMikulski.com has general information about me. Um, my passion project since lockdown is called OpenGlobalMind.com, and it's basically a community of practice of people trying to figure out both how to be open-minded together so that we can bridge these cultural divides, but also how to create a global mind. Because I'm sitting here mm. feeding this brain thing by myself going, where is everybody? This is really fun. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'd like to do that with others. So um, John, thank you very much for having me on your program. It's been a fun conversation. Thank you for the great questions. Yeah. Listen, thanks, Jerry. This has been absolutely fascinating. We could have gone on for hours, uh, but uh, hopefully you come back again and we'll maybe continue this conversation. Uh, thank you all for watching and listening, and I will see you all again really soon. Thank you.